Um, welcome everybody, thank you so much for being here today and taking the time to be here. Um, I'll do introductions later, but firstly we'll do the housekeeping. Um, fire alarm, uh, fire practice is not expected. If the alarm sounds, can all present leave the building as quickly as possible by the way of the nearest exit? And the designated assembly point is in the public square in front of CAST, just beyond the fountain, away from the civic building. Um, if there is anybody with mobility issues, please wait in the refuge area at the top of the stairs where the emergency evacuation lift is located and use the intercom situated to the left-hand side of the lift doors to call assistance. No roll call will be undertaken, thank you. Uh, with mobile phones, in addition, um, I would like to ask everyone to ensure your mobile phone is switched to silent mode, please. And uh, we are filming this meeting. It'll be audio visually recorded and will be available to view on the council's website and YouTube channel. Can I ask all those present to use the microphones to ensure the audio can be captured? And you can do that by pressing that little, uh, the longest uh, red button in front of you. Uh, any members of the public entering the council chamber are accepting that their images will be retained and broadcast by the council. Um, there's no public in attendance. Um, and uh, please note that we are still observing uh, COVID safety protocols. Officers are free to leave the meeting once their item is being concluded. Can I please ask you to sanitize your desks uh, consoles and microphones with the wipes before you leave. This will enable other officers who may be attending later to use your seats. You do not need to wear a mask when seated. However, please can you wear one when moving around the chamber? Thank you so much. Um, moving on to the agenda. Uh, firstly, item number one is apologies for absence. Uh, currently, I have uh, apologies from Councillor Tracy Moran, Councillor Austin White, Councillor Sean Gibbons and Jim Board. I don't believe there's any more. No, Chair. Thank you. And uh, there's uh, no items or issues on the agenda that need to be excluded from the public or press. Um, item number three is declarations of interest. If anybody has uh, an interest, please declare this in a form will need to be completed following the meeting. Please contact Caroline Martin, who can assist you with this process. And item number four is the minutes of the Health and Adult Social Care Overview and Scrutiny Panel held on the 28th of January, 2021, and the 18th of March, 2021, uh, pages one to 18 on the agenda. Um, can we accept that these are true and an accurate record? Thank you. Uh, if there's any public statements, but there's no public, so we can go past that. Um, and that means we can go straight to item six, which is the changes to NHS working, the integrated care system, white paper, and a potential impacts of the changes of that. Um, can I ask um, members and officers of the panel to introduce themselves before we go into this? Um, and I'll start with uh, myself, which is uh, Councillor Sarah Smith, Chair of Health and Adult Social Care. Sorry. Uh, Martin Greenhouse, your Vice Chair of the same panel. Uh, it's Councillor Jake Kearsley, um, Councillor of Town Ward. Councillor Laura Bluff, Bessica Ward. Councillor Sue Knowles, Armthorpe Ward. Councillor Linda Curran, Hatfield Ward. Councillor <clears throat> Andrea Robinson, Portfolio Holder for Adult Social Care. Councillor John Healy, Vice Chair, OSMC. Rupert Suckling, Director of Public Health. Hi, John Gleek from the Policy Insight and Change Team of the Council. Carolyn Nice, Assistant Director for Adult Social Care, here representing Phil Holmes. Hi, uh, Jackie Pedersen, Accountable Officer at Doncaster Clinic on Conditioning Week, and here to um, take part in the presentation today. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. 
um, just for the benefit of the room and the recording, some acronyms uh, that are in the report and that might, might come up are the ICS is the Integrated Care System, the ICB is the Integrated Care Board, the ICP is the Integrated Care Partnership, and the CCG is a clinical commissioning group. Um, there's going to be a, a presentation, and uh, Jackie, it'd be great to hear from you. Thank you for your time today. Thanks, Sarah, and um, thank you for inviting me today. I am going to uh, try my best to tell you how things are going at the moment. Um, I just a bit of context, probably, before we start, that this bill is still going through Parliament, and so there may be changes. Um, and I guess the best way to describe it is the work is ongoing at the moment across South Yorkshire um, to design what the future model might look like. So there, not all of the answers, all the questions are answered at the moment, but I can tell you where we are and um, how things are progressing and, um, and also possibly how you're getting involved and I'm sure Rupert will also explain that as well. So I will start um, and just feel free to jump in and ask me any questions as we go along if that's how you want to do it. More than happy, yeah, okay. So let's get started then. So I was asked to come along and talk about the um, new proposals and what this might mean for Doncaster. Now, um, apologies for those colleagues who may know how all of this works, but I thought it might be worth just a bit of a recap on how the NHS, so I've just done it very simply, um, but how the NHS works at the moment. So we, we know that there's a Department of Health and Social Care at NHS England, and what they do is they set the plan for the country and they say, this is what we want you to achieve. Um, and this is sort of how we want you to do it. NHS England then has the money and they, uh, they allocate that money um, throughout the country to improve um, health services, to deliver health services. And those, um, those, uh, the, the resources that flow through to places at the moment into clinical commissioning groups and the clinical commissioning groups get the resources and say, and, and, and their task is to coordinate services across a place. So that's my job, that's our job in the CCG. Uh, monitor that those services are delivered uh, effectively and also buy additional services if they're, as, as they're required. Um, just for information, Doncaster gets about 580 million pound each year to buy health services in Doncaster. Huge amount of money, but um, a lot of those services are um, you know, uh, it's quite, uh, a lot of the, the money's sort of quite difficult to change how you spend it because a lot of people turn up to a &E, a lot of people need preparations, you know, but there is flexibility and we try and work on those um, edges of flexibility to try and improve and we're always, always trying to get services to be much more efficient. Uh, we're trying to stop people going to a &E when they don't need to, so we invest in community services. It, it's that sort of thing that we do. So we award resources to the different providers across Doncaster and we try and make sure those services are as coordinated as they possibly can be. Um, another good example would be, we work with general practice and uh, other colleagues in the community to try and avoid patients going into hospital, and obviously with Rupert from a public health perspective, we try, uh, if people do go in hospital, we try and ensure the services are as effective as possible. We try and get as many people out of the hospital as quickly as possible to free up their beds, which means that we need good community services, and we need to ensure that those services are provided when they're needed, and that people can go home as quickly as possible as well, which again, we work very closely with local authority colleagues to make sure those services in individuals' homes are as effective as they possibly can be. So that's just a really simple e example of how we work across the whole system. So that bottom box there is we award those contracts, we award those resources, we work together um, as a CCG with our providers and our hospitals and our GP practices then provide those services. So I hope that that's helpful and I apologise if you already know that but I just wanted to put that context. The bit that we're going to talk about today are the two bottom boxes which is around the clinical commissioning groups and the uh, providers, uh, what we call term providers which is trusts, general practice and there are other providers in there as well but there's many, many providers in Doncaster. Just for a bit of context, in South Yorkshire, so the ICS will cover South Yorkshire. At the moment, we've got South Yorkshire and Bassett Law, but Bassett Law is now moving into the ICS in Nottinghamshire, and so we will have Doncaster, Rotherham, Sheffield, and Barnsley. And they, those four CCGs will, um, their functions will become the responsibility of the ICS and the ICB when it becomes established in April. So, I'm 
tell me if this is too basic or not basic enough. It's, if it's okay, just let me know. So, right. So what I wanted to try and explain is sort of how it works now. So I've said we've got the NHS fund, NHS England fund, that comes into the CCG, which is the statutory body. And what our job is, we uh, we plan with our uh, colleagues and partners across the patch. We uh, commission services. That's where we we buy services from those providers. Um, we do the work with public health colleagues and partners to say what's the needs of our population and how to respond to those needs. So that's obviously part of the planning process so that we can put some um, uh, sort of evidence behind how we're allocating those resources and how we're awarding those resources. And then we have an assurance model of assuring the quality of those services that we commission, but also assuring the delivery of those services and, and of course, we, we allocate those resources. Now, um, the governance that we have as an organisation, we have a governing body, a public board meeting every month. Uh, we have uh, a GP that chairs that, David, who's our chair, that some of you may know. We have uh, non-execs on that. We have um, clinicians on that board. And we have committees underneath that undertake some of those functions on behalf. And we're not a big organisation. Um, from a corporate perspective, we, uh, we have a corporate side. We also have a provision side for... Um, some uh, nursing services but we're probably about 120 people in total and that includes the, the governing body as well. So it's very small because obviously we work with our providers and we disperse the, the resources out so our providers can get on and do, do the job really that we need them to do. So uh, number one on, on um, that um, sort of diagram is um, what we do is uh, as an organisation we, we engage, we consult and we plan and we've got something in the middle that, that middle box is called the Doncaster Place Partnership Board. Now um, what we, and it, it's, it's, it's been going for a few years but it's still developing, but what we have uh, in, that, in that middle box is we have all of the, our partners sat around the table um, and every meet every month, at least once a month, our meeting, the last meeting was last Friday and what we try and do there is we go actually all of this resource coming into Doncaster, it's not just about the CCG making those decisions, actually how do we try and make those decisions collectively, how do we decide where we're going to prioritise our energy for the next 12 months and our focus, what's the evidence and actually we try and do that in a collective way. This is quite new and innovative because at the moment statutory organisations in the NHS have, NHS have statutory duties to meet certain um, responsibilities and at the moment um, some of those responsibilities conflict with each other in the sense of we want everyone to collaborate but actually those organisations at the moment have to meet financial balance for example. So if they're not meeting financial balance they need to try and get as much investment into them as possible to cover the cost of the services for example. And, and actually, if we're trying to move money out of the acute sector to invest in community because we don't want people to go into the hospital, it's very difficult for our acute colleagues to go, actually, we're going to give up that pot of money to invest in community because they're not meeting their statutory duties at that time. Um, when we put contracts out, or even the local authority put contracts out, our providers in Doncaster at the moment are competing with each other to win those contracts. And so, um, so it's, it sounds... Working together and deciding what those priorities sounds easy, but actually in the context of the, the environment in which we're working is, is quite difficult for us to do that. But we do it, and we do it in quite a good way in Doncaster. We've made some real progress, and we're all ambitious, and we, that's the way that we want to work. And we try and work as a partnership to ensure that we're all meeting our duties and, and actually make uh, prioritising uh, collectively as much as we can. So we do have our Doncaster Place plan, and you'll have all heard of that, hopefully. Um, uh, we, uh, so we engage, we consult, we plan, we've got our place plan and we work with um, our health and wellbeing board as well and that the health and wellbeing board influences our uh, uh, place plan and the establishment of that. So once we've made some of those decisions, um, what we do as a CCG is we take those recommendations from the partnership board and we then take that back into our CCG organisation and then we award the contracts or we allocate the resources out, it's the same sort of thing. So we award the contracts and we fund the providers to, to do what we've all agreed we want to do. Um, and, um, and so that number two is the feedback into the organisation. Number three, then, is the contractual and oversight arrangements. So that's the money then flowing to providers so they can get on and do the job that they need to do. There's two arrows, because we have done quite a lot of development work in Doncaster over the last few years. We're ahead of the game in lots of, in, in lots of ways around this because what we're trying to do is get everyone to work collaboratively. 
So the blue circle at the bottom is an individual contract to an individual provider. So Doncaster and Bassett Law Hospitals Trust has a contract with the CCG for X millions of pounds so they can treat people and they can see people in, um, you know, in their outpatient departments and they can offer orthopaedic appointments and provide hip replacements and all of those things. So they've got that contract. But what we're trying to do is encourage providers to work collaboratively. So what's been established in Doncaster is something called a Doncaster Provider Partnership. And the local authorities sit around the table, all of the providers sit around the table, and it's provider-led. So I think Catherine Singh, who's the chief executive of R-Dash, chairs that meeting. You've got primary care sat around the table, um, local authority, DBH, uh, FCMS, who's the out-of-hours and urgent emergency care community sort of service providers. There's many providers sat around that table. And what we've decided to do in Doncaster, and the future direction of travel and to test some of this out, is that instead of saying, right, DBH, you've got uh, an amount of money to do A&E services and FCMS, you've got an amount of money to do out of our services and you know, general practice, you've got an amount of money to do um, another part of the, the service model. We're going to give you a pot of money. So here's a pot of money and actually we want you to make, these are the things that we need you to deliver for that pot of money but what we want you to do is sit around the table and you decide how you're going to spend it and you design the services because you're the people that deliver those services and your clinicians know how those services should be developed. So what we're trying to do is give the responsibility um, to the providers so that they can make that decision for themselves. And we're testing that out in a couple of areas. They might seem strange areas, but urgent emergency care is one. Now, um, it's quite new. The contract's sort of still just about 12 months old. I think it might be tomorrow. It is 12 months old. So the, the providers are coming together and they are actually looking at how they can make that system as efficient and as effective as possible um, and deliver the outcomes. That it's, it's obviously a challenging time to do that because of the environment in which we're in at the moment. Wound care is another one. So wound care um, is provided by, every, by our dash, by our out of hours services, by every GP practice, by um, Doncaster and Bassett Law Hospital, by our dash. And it was a very disjointed, it didn't work, it felt disjointed and it didn't feel like it was connected in the way it could be. And of course, when it's like that, so patients can drop between the cracks of the you know, different providers as well. So um, what we did was we've done a big piece of work with our providers to say we want an integrated wound care contract. That went live. That's not 12 months old yet, so that's sort of in its infancy as well. And, and what we have is an ambition to do that more and more. It's really important just to have that in your mind because that is the future direction of travel. Now, You've got the Doncaster Pri Provider Partnership on that third box on the right-hand side. That's the sort of providers all sat round at the table together. Underneath, you've got the pillars. So urgent and emergency care, that might include um, Doncaster and Bassett Law Hospital, general practice, FCMS, and that might be the alliance that needs to deliver that sort of model. But your wound care contract, which is the next one along, includes every provider in Doncaster. So what we've got are pillars underneath. Of, of groups of providers depending on, if, on if it's of interest to them or not. So that's sort of how, um, how that model works. And I'm sure you're all sat there thinking, how complicated can we make things? But this is actually, uh, this is quite, we're trying to make it simple, actually. Uh, and, and I suppose people wouldn't, you know, everything's complex, the local authority's complex, but this is the complexity of a, a, a system where actually we are the NHS but every individual organisation is an individual organisation. And actually, it's probably really important also to point out that every GP practice in Doncaster is an independent business. So it's, 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 we're, we're all under the umbrella of the NHS, but they're all different individual organisations at this point. I'm going to pause and take a breath. Are there any questions? or Does that make sense? In the, there's a lot in there. You, you probably won't remember it all. So what we have, though, in Doncaster is a, is a governance model to, to make this work. Um, and what I've done is just put a little circle around that middle point because that's the, that's the Doncaster Integrated Partnership Board, which was the middle bit where we all sit around the table and we work together. On the left-hand side, what I wanted to demonstrate there is we've got the Doncaster CCG governing body, which I've mentioned, and, of course, the council as well and the local authority. Underneath, we've got a joint commissioning management board and we've already got arrangements where we jointly commission together so we can make decisions through that delegated board on behalf of our governing body and on behalf of you as local authority. There are certain things we can make decisions on collectively and we feed as jointly those decisions also into that partnership board as well. 
The blue bit in the middle is basically um, uh, where all the planning gets done and our senior teams get together. And when we as boards, we say, uh, we, 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 agree, we agree the things that we want to work on. That's the blue bit is the bit of the engine room really about how it's delivered. So that's sort of the doing bit. And then, and then um, the red bit at the bottom is just sort of, it, it identifies, they're the areas that we said we'll collectively work on. I won't get them all right, but at the moment it's things like urgent emergency care, mental health. Um, uh, we have uh, wound care would be one of them because we said we wanted to work on that. So there, are, um, there will be complex lives, I think, is in there. So there's a number of areas that we've said we want to test this model on. We want to test, you know, trying to do this work jointly together and get the money allocated to providers so they can start making decisions on it. So I just wanted to pull out that obviously we do do joint commissioning together as well. So that's how we work at the moment. So um, I probably what I want to say is um, because of the work that we've done in Doncaster, it shouldn't feel we're not a million miles away from where we need to be for the future because we've been trying to anticipate the future. Um, and certainly from a, um, a patient perspective, it shouldn't feel that different because all of this is going on in the background. The services that are delivered shouldn't, won't change. Um, it's just the infrastructure behind the system and how the decisions are made will change. But hopefully, if we get more of that collaboration between our providers, services will improve and people won't drop dead through the cracks of the different organisations. But I will move on. So, what's going to happen from the 1st of April? So, I'll, I can't see this, so I will just take some notes from here. So, um, so, NH, uh, so England is now um, fully covered by the integrated care systems, and, um, and, and these have been in development. So, you'll have possibly heard about sustainability and transformation plans, I think they were called STPs. They quickly moved um, to becoming integrated care systems. And, and in South Yorkshire, we were, no, we were one of the first waves. So we've been around um, and established um, a, a lot longer than most. Now, there is a, an infrastructure across South Yorkshire. And, and at the moment, uh, we're going through, there's been an interim infrastructure in place. And because it, the legislation is going through Parliament, actually, that infrastructure is now um, going through a process of being um, of, of been created formally. So I don't, the best way to say it is we've just recruited a chair to the South Yorkshire patch and the chief exec appointment is just going through and the chief exec appointment process for um, South Yorkshire should take place on the 11th of October. So this is happening nationally. There are 42 chief executive posts that were advertised probably three or four weeks ago and throughout October, uh, the closing date was on Sunday, and throughout October all of those 42 um, posts will be appointed to. We will then have 42 ICSs up and down the country. The reason for that is that um, CCGs will no longer exist. So once those ICSs are established and those chief execs and chairs are in place, they will establish their executive function. And from the 1st of April next year, all of those things that I've just been saying we do as CCGs, for, from four CCGs across South Yorkshire, the integrate, uh, the integrated care system will take responsibility for that. So the CCGs won't exist anymore, and there will be one ICS across South Yorkshire. Um, so we are in transition year, and ICSs will get established from uh, the 1st of April next year. That is subject to, obviously, Parliament, uh, parliamentary agreement and the bill going through Parliament. Um, the, um, I'll not dwell on some of this because I've got a bit more in a bit later, but there will be a, an NHS body, which I'll go into, and a health and care partnership. And... Um, but what's really important is even though we'll have one ICS across South Yorkshire, there is still expected to be a place team working in each of the places. So Doncaster will have a place team and continue to work with providers. The bit we're not quite sure on at the moment is actually what the ICS, when that team gets in, what it will ask Doncaster to do. And there are some of the conversations that we're having at the moment. That's important because once we know what we're being asked to do, we'll be able to establish the infrastructure to be able to respond to that. But we are, we have ambitions of Doncaster, and instead of being waiting to be asked what we want to do, what the ICS wants us to do, we, we're going to say to the ICS, this is what we want to do. So we're going to try and make sure that as Doncaster, we, we put forward and what, what we want to do on, um, within the system. So, um, so this, so hopefully look, this looks pretty similar to how we do it now. Some of the language will have changed, um, and but I'll just talk you through it. 
So I will start at the left again. So NHS England Fund, that will continue. The ICS will now be the, um, the, the, the infrastructure in which we work in. And it will have a board, so, and, a, and a, corporate, a corporate, it will be a, an entity. So it will be an ICB statutory body. It will have very similar um, responsibilities to the CCG because, of course, it's taken on our responsibilities. It will also take on additional responsibilities as well. So um, CCGs also um, lead the contracting arrangements and oversight of general practice contracts <coughs> on behalf of NHS England. They will transfer into the ICS as well. Um, some specialised commissioning will transfer eventually into the ICB and um, dental optometry and community pharmacy contracts will also transfer into the ICB and they're managed by NHS England at the moment, but that won't happen from day one. It will mainly be what the responsibility, the, the, the functions of the CCG that will transition over. Now this might be how it happens, because don't forget I've just said we're gonna be making a pitch to the ICS to say actually this is what we want to do in Doncaster. Um, so, we very similar responsibilities on the left hand side what we want what we will be proposing and what we've agreed and what we want to propose is that bit in the middle that's the partnership board at the moment um, well actually what we will probably need to establish is that as a committee of the icb so the icb will say this is what and we'll say this is what we want to do in Doncaster, and the icb will say yes or no and we'll have some discussion about that but whatever it is the icb will have a board and there'll be delegated responsibility to doncaster and that team to undertake the responsibilities on behalf of the ICB. So we'll need to set up some kind of committee arrangement to, to enact the responsibilities of the, of the um, ICB. That should be all partners sat in the room. There are a number of ways that that can be set up. If it was going to be me, if I'm that sort of place lead, um, actually I might have delegated authority from the board and the chief executive to undertake certain duties. But also um, one of the options is that the committee can everybody sat around the table at the committee can have accountability and joint accountability and that's the model that we want to go for in Doncaster that's the proposal on the table at the moment so the individual who's the place lead may have certain responsibilities de delegated but the committee may also uh, and that's a real important point I think because in some areas they're saying the place lead um, will have the you know that that's that's where it seems to be landing but I think we want to take it one step further and say we have joint accountability as, as chief executives and as organisations sat around that table so that um, there'll be some work to do around that because there'll be some delegation from those organisations into that committee. Um, but it means that, I don't know, Richard Park is the chief executive of Doncaster and Bassett Law or Catherine or, or Damien or whoever sat around that table are jointly accountable for the decisions we're making rather than just the, the place director on behalf of the ICB. Um, so that's... Again, so we'll make, the, so we'll make some decisions around um, what our responsibilities are. We'll work with the health and wellbeing board. The difference this time is that um, there is going to be a, a, something called an integrated care partnership, which Sarah mentioned earlier. And so there's going to be a, 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 an ICB board and there's going to be an ICP, an integrated care partnership. Each place will say what their um, priorities are through the health and wellbeing board process, we think, and we that will be... Um, and so Doncaster, Rotherham, Barnsley and Sheffield will have the integrated care partnership and the integrated care partnership is responsible for creating an integrated care strategy made up from the views of the four places. And what that strategy will say is these are the big problems in Doncaster, Rotherham, Barnsley and Sheffield and these are the things that we think we need to focus on and improve. And what they will do then is the strategy will be written and the ICB and local authorities will legally have to have due regard to what that strategy says. So the ICB will say, thank you for the strategy. Now, um, now these are the things that we think we need Doncaster to do on our behalf through the infrastructure I've just talked about. Um, and these are things we might do once across the patch. And these are some of the things we might just ask providers to do directly. These are the things we're going to ask Doncaster to, to do um, um, as a partnership. And, and, so, um, and so that's how it will work. And, it's, and so what I put on here is it's a bit of a circular model because actually um, what we say in Doncaster should feed up through to the strategy, should go through the board. Um, the resources will be allocated to Doncaster to deliver what we hopefully have said we, our priorities are. So it's a bit of a circular model. Um, really important because actually I talked about 580 million pound coming into Doncaster every year. Um, that money will now go into South Yorkshire 
in Sheffield's Park, Rotherham's Park, Barsley's Park, Doncaster's Park will be joined up together and the ICB will be able to decide how to allocate that resource, of course in partnership with us. Um, so, uh, it, so it's really important that that is a really great strategy that we put into the ICP because that will determine what our priorities are and in some respects will determine how resources flow back through into Lancaster. And, that is, and that's something I'll, uh, we can talk about a bit later, maybe. Um, I have still kept the Doncaster Provider Alliance on there. So in future, as we move forward, we'll have all of the providers and all of the partners sat around that, that committee, all wanting to take accountability in the same way to make decisions, which is fantastic. We've still got the Provider Alliance to one side, where we're giving allocations, so allocate, So we'll, we'll move much more into the future of, here's a pot of money to provide, um, I don't know, let's say, um, dementia services in Doncaster, or elderly services, whatever that might be. Um, and actually, that pot of money will be given to the Provider um, Alliance. If you think about it over time, the bigger that pot of money becomes, the less role that the committee's got, the bigger role the Provider Alliance has got, and those two things will come together at some point in the future is my prediction. So it then gets rid of the provider commission split. It's about that committee making decisions and and, um, and, 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 and and probably working in a similar way to the local authority you do as a local authority where you've got, you don't, ha you don't have the provider commission split such as we do in the NHS. Um, I'm just trying to think if I want to say anything more about that. Have I missed anything, Rupert? The bit there at the moment I'll go back to is the chief executive in place, the chair's just been appointed. We have to agree what will be delegated to Doncaster. And there's, um, it's not on here, but there's also, so, so the way I'm looking at it is in Doncaster, we will have multi-sectoral um, providers working together. So when I'm, I mean acute mental health, primary care, et cetera. So that's our, that's our place partnership. What will also happen across South Yorkshire is your mental health providers will come together and collaborate and your acute providers will come together and collaborate. So you'll have providers working across the system and you'll have uh, the, the same sector and you'll have multi-sectoral providers working together in place. And money can go straight to the, um, the, the, the sector going across South Yorkshire and it can come straight into Doncaster for the multi-sectoral as well. I'll pause there and see anything. There's a lot to take in, I know. And I'm more than happy to come back oh, at any point. Um, that is my prediction. That doesn't mean that that's going to happen. The bill's got to go through Parliament. The, um, the, uh, the, the ICB has got to get established. Um, the ICP's got to get established. And, um, and, and there's a lot to be worked through. And of course, depending on who gets recruited into those executive roles, it will be very dependent on also how they want their organisation to run as well. So, it, but that's sort of my prediction. That's, I guess, that's how I'd like it to work. Um, so, just moving on, um, it's just sort of what you know, what will be different. And I think I've touched on some of these. Um, we we want to try and take competition out as much as we possibly can. It's different for local authorities, but through the bill, they are watering down the competition. Um, side of things in the NHS so that people can collaborate more that we don't have to go out to, uh, and we're waiting for more guidance on that but the ambition is we we can ask providers to, to collaborate together to sit together so they're not competing for the same same work and the same uh, the same um, contracts really so that that and that is really important because that really changes the context and the culture um, and that that will be a big big change um, so, so yes, statutory health commission is in place. It will move to delegated uh, responsibilities for place. That I think I've gone through some of that. So, um, it's and, uh, but the big thing for me is around the opportunity that providers can come together, the clinicians, the people who run the services can come together, and they can help design and have responsibility for how they want their services to be delivered. Um, but I'll not I'll not dwell on that because I think I've sort of um, gone through that. So I did want to just say that what are the challenges for Doncaster? I'm a Doncaster resident. You know, my organisation's not going to exist. I want to know that we're, you, you're all going to be on it and we're all going to be on it and we, I want the best for Doncaster. So um, so the ICP strategy will be very important. This is how we feed our, what we think the priorities are through to the Health and Wellbeing Board and how the Health and Wellbeing Board re interacts with the ICP and how that South Yorkshire ICP strategy is developed. So this will influence how resources flow back into Doncaster 
So my ask is we keep an eye on it and we influence the ICP as it becomes established. The ICP is not established yet and it is up and, and once the chief executive and the chair are in place in, in the ICS and the ICB, um, they'll be working with the local authority to establish that. Now it is a, I might get this wrong Rupert, but it's a committee of the ICB and a committee of local authorities. So it's an equal partner. So you will be involved and you will be influencing how that ICP is established. So it's really important that, you know, that that's, that's taken very seriously. I think I mentioned this, resources that will now come in South Yorkshire, but they'll be distributed across four places by the ICB. So again, that strategy is really important and how we influence that because we need to get make sure that Doncaster gets the best possible deal as, as we can for our residents. Um, it's, this is, um, there'll be an upheaval for a while, upheaval for people like me, not upheaval for patients and you know, services. Um, uh, that sh you know, that th the changes will come later and that should be a positive. Uh, but we just need to keep. I, I put, we need to keep our eyes on the prize, and I've all, I'm a real believer that actually our providers and the people who deliver the services know how to design those services. So let's just really try and encourage the system to work collaboratively and get in a room together. And you know, um, you know, wouldn't it be great if one day when we can get the acute trust to go? Do you know what? We know we need to invest in upstream because we can't deal with the demand coming through the door. And the only way to stop that is investing in, in prevention. And that's sort of where we need to get to. Um, ensure that clinicians remain central to decision making and system design. This for me is, is not come out hugely in some of the um, in some of the uh, guidance so far, and I know we are feeding that back in. But if you think about it, our governing body at the moment, we've got four GPs, one secondary care doctor, and we've got a clinical chair who's a GP as well. Um, in the future, I think we need to think carefully about how our local committee is established and to make sure we've got the right clinical representation around there as well as uh, officers. And we also need to be influencing how the ICP and how the board um, and the committee structure at the ICB um, is established. And then maintaining positive working with patients and residents and also ensuring decision making is transparent. I've already said that our governing body meets in public um, every month. Uh, we have our AGM every year and all of that sort of thing. So we, we you know, we very public facing. Um, when we sit up the committee arrangements, I think uh, we probably need to anyway, but we just need to make sure we maintain that transparency because I, I think uh, there's a potential for the decision making to look like it's been taken further away from the people it serves that are served. So we need to make sure we keep that transparency in Doncaster. What are the opportunities for Doncaster? So I thought I'd end on a bit of a high. Um, I think there's a real opportunity for joint decision making and resource allocation across health and social care. So if you think about that middle bit, the, the sort of the, the committee, um, the, if we get to a point where everyone's accountable sat around that table and we're making decisions on the money that's coming into Doncaster, um, actually, wouldn't it be great if we could get social care and our local authority pots of money sat around there as well? So we're making money, decisions on health and social care pots of money together because then we can design services together and we can allocate service, uh, resources together. So that is a real ambition. I think that is uh, something we should aim for and really consider. Um, uh, we Organisations are given the tools to work even closer together and that's that moving from competition to collaboration. Um, again, I think I've covered a lot of this. Providers will have much more control over how resources are used, how it's spent and how our service is delivered. Um, Community-based services are working together around groups of GP practice and integrating into communities. Now, I've not really touched on this, but there is a big push that primary care networks become um, uh, uh, are at the forefront of delivery in communities. And you may not be aware, but primary care networks are a group of GP practices that come together to work together. And a lot of um, resources have been put into those um, PCNs over the last few years to get additional, it's called additional roles. So pharmacists, um, uh, physios, um, uh, pa paramedics, etc., working with practices to try and uh, and work across a, a, a geography so that patients are um, are not just always seeing a GP, can see another professional, uh, uh, but they're working much more as a, a, a unit. Now that's really in its infancy, but that is being pushed through. And and I know um, collectively across ourselves and local authority, we've got a real ambition to invest in localities um, and actually ask localities to um, improve outcomes in certain areas. So again, that's the allocative model. Here's a pot of money. These are the issues that we know we've got. 
you come together, you sit down together, work out how you might improve those outcomes. So it might be isolation and loneliness in one area, it might be diabetes in another, it might be obesity in another. And we've just got to start being a bit brave and we, we want to try and test some of that. So there is a real opportunity around getting that resource into community and getting community providers and voluntary sector and other providers in those localities working together. But I do think, probably just to put a bit of a, uh, just to throw it in, um, is that I think PCNs will be the anchor institution in those lo locality areas, that, that's what's coming through. Um, opportunities for other sectors, so, such as voluntary sector, that provider alliance that I talked about, um, it's made up of statutory organisations, but mainly statutory organisations at the moment. I really want to try and make sure that before we CCD doesn't exist, that the voluntary sector sit around that table. The voluntary sector already sit on our partnership board, but if the providers are going to be making decisions on how they deliver services and where our resources are allocated, it's a fantastic opportunity for the voluntary sector, and it's a fantastic opportunity for providers, because they can't deal with the demand coming through the door at the moment, so why not get voluntary sector in there as well? Um, and then there should be equity of access and outcomes for Doncaster residents, no matter where they receive their care in South Yorkshire. That goes back to um, the uh, single sector working across South Yorkshire. So if you've got all of your acute providers working collectively together, um, they can come up with, uh, they, they'll be tasked with, I'm sure, and they can come up with solutions about how they work together and support each other, but how everybody gets the same access to those services as well. So I think that should happen over, but these, these things will take a long time though. Um, I'm going to stop there. I think that was it. I'm happy to take questions. I know I said I'd take them through. There's just so much in there. Um, and some of it is prediction, to be honest. But I'm, I'm more than happy to take any questions. Sorry, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Jackie. That was amazing to go through that in such detail in, in a relatively quite short amount of time and making it really simple for us. So thank you so much for that. And um, we do have some questions. Um, I'm going to kick off. Uh, with one, um, and which is obviously in the guidance in the white paper, it talks a lot about how the integrated care system focuses on inequality and is driven by the needs of local populations rather than the interests of existing uh, health and care services. Um, as, and this is especially important in Doncaster where we use a locality uh, working model already. Um, which will provide different needs assessments. How, so how do you think that works like uh, in this model? I think that'll, I mean, I'll, I will, I'll answer and then I'll hand over to Rupa as well, because I think that will, uh, be, that should be a place responsibility. Um, I, I think probably as an ICS, they might set some ambitions around that and that will feed up again through the, what we send up to the uh, integrated care partnership and the strategy. But I do think that should be a place responsibility and we are testing that out. So I think it goes back to um, some of the locality working that I was doing. So we've already started saying, what are the big issues in the south? What are the big issues in the north? What are the big issues in central? And we can, we can identify the differences and we can target uh, the discussion with our providers to say, this seems to be a particular issue in the south. How do we come up with solutions together to do that? Um, so we have, we are starting to, we, we're trying to get to a point where we're testing that thinking and we want to try and move forward on that this year. I think, I think it will be a gift for us as a place as well to say what our ambitions are around inequality. So we can do that, that's a practical side I probably talked about, but what's our ambitions and we can set the ambition for Doncaster as well as, as partners. Um, I think there's many inequalities and um, I think, I think I would want to see that we, we don't just go down the traditional route. I think we need to look at it in a much broader spectrum, but that will be the gift of the committee. It will be the gift for us to also influence that through the ICP, is what I would say. But uh, Rupert, you may have other views on this. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Jackie. I mean, completely agree. I mean, I think in the absence of a national sort of target around inequalities, it does rely on us as a place to set our own ambition out. And the two main mechanisms that we've got to do that are through the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, and we'll hear a bit about that uh, later, and through the Health and Wellbeing Strategy, and they're both tasks that the Health and Wellbeing Board has. I suppose the other part that we've not really touched on um, yet is about what the role of scrutiny is going to be in the new um, uh, arrangements. 
and we would still expect scrutiny to have uh, uh, the same um, responsibilities in terms of you know major service change but also setting a work program and looking at that so I think over the next year you'll want to think as a as a scrutiny panel but also with other scrutiny panels across you know South Yorkshire how you might want to address some of these issues like inequalities so you might want to do that uh, jointly or you might want to do that individually uh, and then finally as Jackie said you know these are still going to be statutory organisations so things like uh, equalities duties due regard those sorts of things should still be uh, done but really it is about us um, being able to tell the story of the inequalities that we um, see and what we want to do about them and really sort of almost supplying that to the new ICS and asking them to take action and then it will be up to all of us to help implement it or hold them to account if that doesn't happen. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to pass on to uh, my colleagues. Uh, Sue Knowles, you've got a question, thank you. Um, hi. How do we ensure that the integrated care system provides sufficient, sufficient focus on the health and well-being of children and young people, uh, which receives relatively little attention is, and is absolutely fundamental to a happy and healthy Doncaster? Well, I, I, I'm going to sound like I'm repeating myself, but I do think it's our, again, it's for us to be feeding that through the JSNA, through the health and wellbeing link to the ICP. Um, I, um, but also, I am aware that, um, you know, it talks about these sectoral um, collaboratives across the patch. I know that a children's um, collaborative is also being considered and looked at. Um, I, so I, I, I think it's, it's quite a simple answer at the moment. I think it's up to us to make sure that it, is um, but there are at the moment there's, there's only a requirement for a mental health and an acute collaborative in the in, a, in an ICB in a, an ICS system but but the ICS is really keen to actually make sure that children are a, um, a priority now I also talked to Rihanna and um, we, we not only do we need to make sure it's a, a, a responsibility at the ICB level but we need to make sure it's a responsibility at the Doncaster level as well and that those partnership arrangements that I talked about I'm currently talking to Rihanna about how we make sure that the child's voice is much more prominent in there as well um, so I think it's uh, it's we, we need to make sure it happens and as the these organizations established we need to make sure that that's uh, that we, we make sure that's feeding in. Um, sort of following or expanding that really, um, as you know here in Doncaster we have a fantastic young, fantastic young advisors for CYP. They've recently been surveyed and found out what's important to young people in Doncaster, which was domestic violence and mental health. This is a key voice for us to hear and learn from. How do voices like young advisors fit into the way this model works? Again, I, I think that's place. And actually we fund that, and we fund that between the CCG and, um, and uh, the local authority at the moment. And we absolutely use the voice of those advisors at the moment to influence what we do. Um, we, uh, we heard that mental health uh, a few years ago now, I was at uh, an event with a lot of young advisors and a lot of young people and um, it came through really clearly. It's interesting that domestic um, violence is coming through because it was mental health a few years ago and we've really invested in that um, and we've continued to invest in the young advisors. So I think what I would say is it's probably a model that I would be um, promoting across South Yorkshire but I think, I think uh, we will still have a lot of flexibility and resource flowing into Doncaster to be able to prioritise um, how we spend that resource. I think I think that's one for us really. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd add to that, I mean, the Health and Wellbeing Board through Councillor Blake is really keen to uh, increasingly have people with lived experience coming to the board and describing some of the, the challenges that they they face. And so I think the young advisor model. Not only do we want to keep that in for young people, we want to look and see how we get that in other. Uh, group. So just recently we had um, representations from the carers group and from uh, people with learning disability and autism, but I don't think it's quite consistent 
enough yet and that's that's our task but because those are where the stories really are held and we need the heroes I think just to add at the beginning of every governing body every month we always have a patient story as well so it's very similar and again I think when we move forward and whatever we set up in place we, you know we need to be open transparent public meetings but we also need to be continuing with things that Alan suggests as well Oh, thank you so much, uh, Sue. Um, Councillor Bluff. How will the, inter uh, the integrated care system work alongside the Doncaster Health and Wellbeing Board and scrutiny to ensure the joint planning and uh, public accountability? I'll start with the bit that I know. Um, it, it's the, the so the health and it's been in the gift for the uh, it's been the gift for the ICB and local authorities to design the um, the ICP the integrated care partnership and it is you are equal partners and it's a committee of both the board and local authorities so joint partners on there and at this point in time conversations are starting about how that's going to be established in fact guidance came out last week I think it was about th there will be some parameters about how that integrated care partnership will be established there's a lot of flexibility so those conversations are starting. Um, it makes sense if there's going to be a, a, a care strategy for South Yorkshire, um, and it's uh, and and it's a, a that ICP is a, a committee of local authority and, and health. Um, that the health and wellbeing board from each place actually feed up into that um, arrangement. So uh, what I can see really practically is that Rupert will lead the J JSNA. That will, it will be fed through the Doncaster partnership, so we'll be feeding into that and supporting the discussion about what the priorities are for Doncaster. We'll have the JSNA, we'll have a Doncaster strategy, I assume, that's signed off at the Health and Wellbeing Board, and that'll go up and be recommended up to the ICP. I, I, I can see that that's one way to do it, or at least a starting point to get the Doncaster priorities fed through into the, into the, into the ICP, into the Integrated Care Partnership. Um, I don't know how the scrutiny. I'll be honest with you. I don't know how the scrutiny side is going to work at the moment. Um, there's so much, so many unknowns. Of it, but I, I mean, colleagues from local authority know, might know a bit more about this. Yeah, we've had nothing further in terms of uh, any substantive changes to the role of uh, scrutiny. So I think it will be about scrutinising major decisions and then having your work plan and agreeing what you want to, to look at over the course of the year. I think the only other thing I'd say is, as well as those sort of products from the Health and Wellbeing Board, the, the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment and the strategy, I do expect there to be some cross-representation on each of the groups. So there'll be some people on the Health and Wellbeing Board that are on the, the Partnership Board locally, and there may also be people from the Health and Wellbeing Board that are on the Integrated Care Partnership. So it's not just about sending a document into a black hole. There will be people in those um, spaces advocating for Doncaster. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I have a question which is uh, we'd like to put more emphasis on a preventionist model. How does the integrated care system work to act sooner to prevent preventable conditions? and get the care as quickly as possible? Like what is different and how it's achieved in the rest, how's it achieved here if say the rest of South Yorkshire wants to focus on hospital care, for example? What would, how do you think it will happen? Yeah, so I think one of the um, real opportunities with the, the model is that we talk much more about outcomes and much more about groups of uh, providers so um, if you think about um, I don't know, take diabetes for instance you know instead of waiting for everyone to get diabetes and then giving them really good care at the hospital uh, which um, can be what happens if you're working just with the hospital what we'd be looking to do is work across all of our providers and look at how we can get the best outcomes for that population and that group of people and that will uh, potentially give us the opportunity to shift money from the acute end up to the um, more preventative end. 
Uh, it sounds easy, but it's very difficult to do. But this model does give us more opportunity, more chance to do that than any of the previous sort of commissioning and contracting models that we've had in the past. And the only thing I'd add to that is that um, when the health strategy is developed by the ICP and it feeds through back through to the board, etc., I think I think there's a real opportunity to to actually focus on not just health but the wider determinants. And I think the borough strategy model that we've had in Doncaster is, is a really good model. So, you know, health is the caring bit of the borough strategy, but is that we also work collectively on education and on working and on living. And we all hold each other to account. We all, you know, try and work together on those areas. And um, I just think that's a, a different model. And I don't think, because I always think, I work in health and it's, you know, it's been an amazing career, but... You know, once people hit health, we've sort of lost it because we're dealing with the consequences, and we've got to get upstream. And if we just at the ICB deal with health, we just we're in a sausage machine, don't we? Just and we just too much demand. So I, I would hope that the ICB also has a significant influence and eye to the wider determinants and working across those other sectors and Sheffield City Region and all that sort of thing to get the prevention model really centre to what it does. Brilliant. So that's just a follow-up question from that is um, obviously funding there is uh, is quite um, important. So like we'll see, I think you sort of said it in your presentation, like how do you kind of get partners to shift from that kind of hospital into that sort of community level and like obviously local authorities aren't getting any more money it seems as well so I'm not sure if the if you know you, we have control over being able to shift that over um, well we do have control over how to shift that over but it's very difficult um, it's very difficult to do because actually but if, I, if we just went, said to the organisation actually instead of funding you giving you the funding that you need, we're going to actually move that. Well, that organisation might not be able to be sustainable at that point. And so there are some of the challenges that we work with. Um, yeah, it's, it's, that's, it's the, it's the um, hypothesis that this will allow the movement of money and will be tested over the, you know, over the coming years. Um, we have providers who are saying we cannot deal with the demand through the system. What we probably need to be trying to do is get non-recurrent resource so what you can sometimes do is you can go, actually, we can't take that money out of you this year and create a big black hole. But what we can do is we can have non-recurrent money invest it, which will have an impact, which will reduce income, which means you don't need the money, if that makes sense. So you have the non-recurrent non money is very useful in that sort of way. So we could say, um, in a simplistic way, actually, we can invest... X amount of money in general practice, and if we do that and it works, we know that we're going to reduce admissions into A and E by whatever. If we've managed to do that, we haven't taken the money out of DBH this year, but we know we can take it out next year because we can reduce the costing for staffing and, you know, and um, you know, equipment and all of that sort of thing. And that's just a very simplistic way, but that's the way to make transition happen in this very difficult environment. But you have to invest, release resource. To then be able to um, to be able to move them around the system, and, and that and that's that is the challenge. But that discussion, um, you know, will be taking place with providers in the future. Thank you so much. Sorry, Rupert, would you like to add to that? Uh, I was going to say nothing to add, but I suppose the only thing um, that you do see somewhere in some. Um, Places people are looking at setting um, a sort of um, a target or a percentage of the budget that should be spent on prevention. So that you know maybe over you know uh, you know a period of time you might see five percent or ten percent being spent on prevention. Um, so that's another way of people are trying to, to look at this. But uh, Jackie's right. You know that is the in the intention and the challenge is to ha is how to move the money. Uh, around, but sometimes a target is a good thing to um, uh, encourage uh, innovation and different ways of working. Sometimes it uh, people feel it's too it's too difficult and it puts them off. So I think we need to work carefully about how that uh, plays out. Just to add, it doesn't help 
that actually it's challenging enough to move the money around the system in health. Talk about prevention, that money sits in the local authority in public health. So actually, that's even more of a challenge. So we do need to get to a point where, well, it would be great if we could get to a point where we say we're making decisions on a total pot of money that includes health, it includes public health, for example, so that we're all talking about one pot of money because that takes away these challenging barriers around, well, actually, it's local authority responsibility or it's health responsibility because we, do, you, we, we can get into some of that if we're not careful. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's just a point I would make. Please, you know, in the future, that's something we'll need to consider. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the presentation so far. I have a question here, but just to go back on the finance side, we have a, a 580 million pot as, as such, as a local authority. The CCG, sir. Uh, is there any chance or what system might be accountable to the electors in this borough if the, um, the pot is allocated away to other parts of South Yorkshire that may be, in our opinion, deservedly spent here? What was the question? Because I, I think that is a potential... So, um, because it no longer, be, so in, over time, that is not a pot that belongs to Doncaster, because at the moment it's allocated, there's, a, there's an allocation formula that adds up to that 580 million, so that, that's an allocation formula. Um, it, we don't know how that allocation formula is going to work in the future, but what we do know is that the ICS will get that pot of money, and then depending on what, how we articulate what our challenges are and how, what we need to do in Doncaster, um, the, the, the ICS and the ICB will decide how that resource is allocated, but it doesn't, it's not just going to be a few people sat in a room, you know, with a stroke in a white cat sort of thing. It's, we are going to all be um, involved in that process, and there will be, um, should be open and transparent decision making processes around that. But the fundamental point I always I keep coming back to is what we present and what we put through that integrated care partnership and what we say our challenges are and how effective we do that is a place will influence on the resources that are allocated to Doncaster. Um, but there will be a way of allocating those resources. So I just don't know how that will happen at the moment. And I share that concern because I can see there could be potential economies of scale by integrating the, uh, the, uh, the providers. But also there could be some kind of uh, in, uh, inequalities in, in how that could be apportioned. It's a concern, but we just need to mitigate against that concern by ensuring that we are really influencing and working with and helping to design the ICB, is what I would say. Um, so we need a strong voice in that. Uh, thank you for that ad hoc. Well, now I'll go back to my, uh, my scripted diversion. And uh, that would be, uh, how do you envisage the ICS uh, can work around the uh, long-term uh, planning barriers in adult social care and joining up services. I'm sure Carolyn might want to say something uh, about this. I mean, the, the, the core or the key thing I think that we have locally is we've got some common uh, ambitions that we want to, to, to do. And what we also have is a common set of measures in terms of what good looks like and what we think good looks like for uh, Doncaster and our challenge is to take those into the conversations with the ICS and to make sure that those responsibilities get delegated back down to to place so for instance uh, you know probably we would all say that care of the elderly most of that happens out in the community small amount happens in the hospital that needs to be a place responsibility whereas intensive care I think that probably is something that that should be managed by the the ICS. So the first bit is about sort of positioning the the um, sort of responsibility as part of the local um, uh, approach, and then we've got the opportunity through the localities work and the work that uh, Carolyn and Phil are doing to um, redefine some of the sort of the vision and the the purpose around adult social care 
to embed more prevention uh, locally. Carolyn, did you want to say anything? It is going to be. Yeah, I can. Yes, yes, sorry. So, um, completely agree with everything that, that's been said. And I think from my point of view, it's, it's a combination of all of those things. So, the planning barriers, if you like, will be overcome by the people that are doing the work to make sure that we're sitting around the table, that we're well informed, that we've got a good evidence base through the GSNA, that we are place based, that we are looking at localities, that we are advocating for Doncaster, and that we are part and parcel of what we're putting forward through to the ICB and the ICS in terms of what the local areas need. I think in Doncaster we're really lucky that we've got really good working relationships to start from. So there's some strong relationships in terms of how we put forward um, the, the plans for the, the localities, for neighbourhoods that we want to achieve in Doncaster, underpinned by the evidence base that we've got via the JSNA and public health and NHS information as well as what we've got in the local authority. Uh, thank you. I think the only thing I would um, add is, um, you know, we need to be really clear that um, social care, you know, particularly adult social care, is more than just discharging people early from hospital. And there is a, you know, there's a, there is a bit of a narrative, and sometimes it's in the media that that's all that social care is there to do. If only social care was helping discharge people from hospital, it would all be better. Actually, you know, the role of social care is so much broader than that in the role of supporting people at home to be independent across all age groups. So I think you know it, it's an opportunity for us to re sort of state that relationship with the ICS in terms of what social care uh, brings to the party. It's not just about uh, hospital discharge, although that's probably what's going to be in the media all of the winter. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, I have a, a, a structure question, which is, Obviously, currently in the CCG, we have quite a lot of uh, clinical uh, members on the board uh, that represent each locality. Um, I know we're sort of, strict, sort of switching to the primary care network model now, um, but I was just wondering how we're going to ensure that, because I think the clinical voice is super important on these boards, that we do make sure that the clinical voice in all different places get heard through. It seems like there's only a small amount of clinical voices on these boards. Um, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I've literally just finished a conversation with uh, Lupa and um, Damien about this. And um, we've got to a point, what I presented this morning is I think that this is where we land in our preferred model for Doncaster around the committee and yeah, et cetera. And, uh, and we just, we're just about to write all of that up so that we can say to our ICB chief executive and chair that that's how we want to work. Um, that committee, the bit in the middle, we, uh, we need to then get our heads together and say, um, if everybody's going to be accountable, how is that going to be work? What decisions have to be made for all of those sorts of things? And so we and, and, and specifically asked, said this morning that it's going to be important that cl there's clinical representation on there. Um, not just clinical representation, I think there's probably going to be lay representation, you know, we, but the fact is we all need to get in a room together and we need to really design what we want that to do, how it wants to work, who needs to sit around the table and, and the transparency as well and that's what, you know, sort of the public facing side of things that I'm really keen on. Uh, so the, the answer is, I don't know yet, but we've, uh, we've said this morning that we're going to write up the, where we are as a, as a place and we're on with that and, um, and our recommendation is going to be that we set up a, a small group to bottom it and, and make sure that all of those things we've just talked about are, are considered and hopefully included. Thank you. Uh, Councillor. Oh, yeah. Um, so the, the constitution of the ICB is obviously quite important. Um, do we have one already and when do we find out who are on the boards? There is a draft constitution um, that has been published, but the draft national constitution has a lot of holes in it. So it sort of stipulates the minimum requirements of a board. Um, I will get it wrong, but you, there is obviously a chief executive and a chair, a director of finance, a medical director, uh, a director of nursing, um, and there are partner um, representatives on there. Um, there is, as a minimum, a local authority representative, a, G a primary care representative, uh, but it's a GP, primary care. When we talk about primary care in NHS, it's opt-on centrist. 
pharmacist GP, but it actually it stipulates GP and a provider representative, but that's minimum. So, um, there's, so there are other things. So, it's, so there's a, 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 an empty, a, a document that's populated with the main things and the, all the legal bits, but the, the, the interesting bit has got to be worked through. I was on a call this morning where the view is, um, well, I've had two competing different deadlines. I was told by Christmas that's got to be populated, but I was on a call this morning that said by mid-November that's expected to be populated and signed off by regional office. Um, that work's starting. Um, interestingly, even though CCGs aren't going to be around, CCGs are responsible for making it happen, but the view is that the chief executive chair obviously will be instrumental in populating it, in, in engaging with people to get views to populate it um, because they're going to be running the organisation. And I think it's just this interim period where we're still a statutory organisation. Um, certainly, uh, that work is starting now, and I'm sure you'll be getting engaged in that as a, as a member of, of the local authority. Great, thank you. Um, in the presentation, one of the slides, it, it has um, provided us to have much more control over how resources are used, how money is spent, and where services are delivered. Um, have you got like an example, perhaps, of how you'd see that working in practice? I just touched on it quickly in the presentation, but the, probably the best example, uh, and not everywhere's got this at the moment, so we are a bit sort of ahead of some, some areas. Um, we, we've created what we call um, an alliance. It's, technically, it's not an alliance. We, we, we've created a, a, a contract with a, a lead provider, but actually all our providers have come together in Doncaster um, to deliver urgency emergency care. Now, you have to agree which services are in urgency emergency care. So we've got GP out of hours, the urgent treatment centre, the front door at A&E. There's, there's, a, there's a, a number of services that we sort of put a net... A, a net around, a ring around really and said actually um, these services we think this is the best way to deliver, well, this is the model that we've got at the moment and we designed that with our provider colleagues um, historically um, but actually we want you to achieve these outcomes and here's this is how much money is available to deliver those services those services together um, we actually went out to the market for that one and our, we had the alliance in Doncaster bid for it and win that contract that was a great thing to do because it meant that it established the governance. That means that not only can they do urgency emergency care, but as we move forward, they can add more and more services to, to that model. So basically, our providers in Doncaster, um, a, a subset of our providers in Doncaster, have a pot of money to deliver urgency emergency care, and it includes front door of A&E, urgent treatment centre, GP out of hours, plus, plus, plus. They can now sit in a room together and say, we've got a pot of money. This is how those services are being delivered at the moment. Does it work? Can we improve it? How can we make it work better? And that, that's, so that's just a really perfect example of how providers will in future be able to make decisions. Because normally, it would be my organisation and our team saying, well, like, we're getting you all together and actually we'll design the service together and actually we'll give you a contract for that part of the con uh, ser that service. We'll give you a contract for that service. We'll give you a contract for that service. And it's separate contracts. We're saying, here's a pot of money. Here are the services you work out how you can actually deliver them as well as you possibly can, as efficiently as you can. So any efficiency, you can also reinvest in those services as well. Um, so that, that's the example I would give. That's great, thanks. And just a very quick follow-up. Um, how will the ICS um, reduce bureaucracy so that Doncaster people find it easier to get support with their health and care needs um, and staff can kind of like focus on the support and ensure a local improvement? Um, I... I'm not sure, but to be honest, because it's not established yet, so the governance arrangements aren't established. But the example I also give you is one is, is an example of how it could work. So instead of somebody sat there trying to administer and performance manage, and you know work with many many providers, it's it's that you you know all of those pieces of paper are flying around the system. All of those contracts aren't being negotiated every year. You know um, that should reduce bureaucracy, and that's just one example. But until the ICB is established, it's quite difficult to understand exactly how the bureaucracy might be reduced at that corporate level. That's, that's great, thanks. Thank you. Um, we were, I was wondering, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Can I just ask a question that actually just follows on from Councillor Keir's legs? Um, I just obviously need to declare that I do actually work for the voluntary sector, 
But I just wanted to know, you were talking about structures and boards. How is the voice of the sector going to be heard? Because a lot of the prevention measures are, are at that level, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, thanks for that. I, um, so you'll be aware then a few, um, Joe was still here. We had quite um, a, a big promotion of trying to get the voluntary sector to work collectively together. And we support the voluntary sector on that uh, to get, to, we did to get established and we still do voluntary action Doncaster. So there's been great progress over the last few years and we it feels like we are getting a a voice for the vo you know to be able to engage with the voluntary sector through uh, vo uh, through bad and um kath already sits on that partnership board the chief exec of voluntary action doncaster she sits on the partnership board where we do the planning and the prioritization etc um what i want is and what i'm talking to kath about and also the the provider alliance, so all the statutory providers who sit round the table together, um, on that right hand side on the on the slide, I'm in discussion with Kath and the chair of that group to say, actually, how do we make sure the volunteers that, that bad have a take seat round that table as well? And because when when providers are receiving pots of money and are saying how do we deliver these services, I think there's a real place for vol the volunteer sector there uh, to be able to contribute. So we need. We need BAD sat around the table at the Provider Alliance, so I think that's how we can contribute. Thank you, Councillor Kidd. That's a really good question. Um, I was wondering, um, do we get a say in the South Yorkshire Integrated uh, Care System um, like our, on the workforce? Can we train more people? Can we um, ask for more? Um, specialist staff in certain areas? Um, I don't, I mean, it's, that's such a big question because it's one part of the NHS that um, I'm not um, hugely um, uh, aware of because there's a, there's a section called Health Education England, they do all the training, etc. And you'll probably be more aware of it than me. Uh, oh, I am aware of it. But um, so it's, it's how do we crack the full. It, it, the forward planning on workforce um, predictions in the future and then influence how Health Education England can make sure that the placements are there through universities, etc. Um, there, there is going to be, in the ICB, there is a requirement to have a people's directorate um, which will have responsibility for workforce and workforce planning and all of that sort of thing and make the connections with the universities, I assume, but also with places to try and say, what is your workforce need going to be in the future? It's, it's always such a been, been such a very, very difficult um, task because the ask always changes. Um, there's going to be people, I, I, I can't answer your question properly, Sarah, to be honest, but I do know that there'll be a people's directorate in the ICB and I, I would guess that that will be part of their responsibilities. Rupert, may be able to help. Yeah, I think it's uh, going back to something that Jackie said earlier. So, you know, if the if this is successful, this is more than just about providing healthcare. This is the, the role of the organisations in terms of, uh, you know, skills, training, developing people. So, you know, I think what we've done locally is we're, we're quite good at identifying where our gaps are. Uh, in the past, we've had challenges attracting people to come into Doncaster. So what the hospital and others have done is to start sort of training our own. We've got the same in sort of adult social care with the uh, academy and the links that the acute hospital have got with some of the secondary, so in particular Hall Cross. So I think, you know, this is a, an area where we've got to know what our workforce needs are. We've got to have some mechanism of training our own and then we've got to sort of bend other people's ears to make sure that when the resources and there are new placements, um, that they look to Doncaster as a place where um, training happens. Because I think if we train people locally, we've got much more chance of uh, retaining people. And if we're honest, retaining staff is probably the bigger challenge than just training them in the first place. So, you know, across the healthy care system, you know, you just look at the number of people that um, Amazon and others are looking to recruit over the winter period and retention is a, is a bigger challenge, if not more of a challenge uh, than recruitment. Thanks for that, Rupert. That, that's, yeah, I was looking at it. Somehow. So that's great to bring it back to Doncaster. I think what I would also add to that is uh, there's something about creating an aspiration as well for the play, for the people of Doncaster and, and the career progression that health and care can provide. Um, 
We, I think, again, I go back to the Borough Strategy. I think the Borough Strategy's worked well in Doncaster, certainly from a living, working, learning, etc. And really felt that when we, as health, got into those discussions and debates with our colleagues across the wider partnership, that we were, you know, it really we started the conversation. Well, we need to grow our own. We need to show the people of Doncaster the career that they can have in Doncaster. And and you know, and I think that really started that conversation. And that's why we've got some of these great things happening and it was absolutely through that borough strategy model and all sat around the table talking together so i, I completely am committed to that as well it's uh, it's been a, it's it's been a really good um there's been a lot of progress with our providers over a short period of time that's amazing thank you um i'm aware of time and um, so uh, there's a couple of questions that we were going to ask, I think, but um, we probably will have another briefing session a bit closer to the time on this, uh, likely. Um, so I'm just going to go straight to uh, Councillor Coran for her. Thank you. The NHS, the ICS uh, design framework says that we, in the ICS and the B and the P at the end of them all, are responsible for being able to clearly communicate with those changes and that is the ICIs in uh, and that's oh sorry and the ICS and does for communities is this something that you are taking into consideration when making all the new resources and documents to make it understandable and engaging for the public do apologize for that at the beginning work no, I think it's uh, I think it's a good question, and I would say we need to, but it's not landed yet. I mean, I uh, what I was going to say at the end is I hope this has been helpful. I hope we've got something out of it, but I can't answer all your questions at the moment. And so I think as soon as we know and the bill is passed and the chief exec's in place and the structure of the ICS is established and all of those things, that we, that we need some engagement with it. But we need to we need to let the public know what's happening. They shouldn't know. They shouldn't see a huge. They shouldn't see any difference. To be quite honest, from the first of April, and it's sort of, you know, it's it's. We can let them know, but it, it, should, it shouldn't have a, an impact. But you, you're absolutely right. But I don't think the time's right because I, I, you'll have seen today. Uh, it's quite difficult to articulate where we are at the moment, and, and you're sort of predicting what's going to happen. Currently. So I'm not quite sure what the question was. Oh, sorry, so, <laughs> right, okay. But um, the way that the GP contract works, they are private businesses, and there are two ways that they get funded mainly. One is that they get a capitation. Uh, it's a, a formula. Uh, it's got cap 
reputation is probably the wrong word, but they get so much money for their list size, and that's for a core contract, so that's for a core service offer. And then they get additional resources to provide additional services on top of that. Um, and one of the additional resources, one way that they're getting additional resources at the moment is through um, creating primary care networks and working together. And nationally, a lot of the resources that are coming through above and beyond their core contract is encouraging them to work collectively as primary care networks to cover a bigger geography. So I think that's what we'll see moving forward more and more. Um, and, and also, my personal view, and again, I do talk to GPs about this, but if, if providers are sat around a table and they put their money in the pot and they're making decisions about it, general practice needs to do the same. And I think that'll be there when they're additional, they, they, there'll be a discussion about the resources for primary care, but it, the core, I think, will be protected, at least for a, a while, and to be any additional resources, how do they put that in pot so that they can have that conversation with partners to say, how does this pot of money get spent? What public health money might be in the pot, mental health money might be in the pot, primary care and health services money might be in the pot, and then everyone sat around the table with the accountability and can make decisions on that. I don't know if that helps. Okay. Um, And there's um, primary care networks and general practice, I think, have been identified as at the forefront on and that sort of um, the role uh, that mo most people see their GP or their practice. Um, so what's been happening is the um, primary care networks have been established and they're um, working across geographies, but there's been quite a lot of investment over the last few years for these additional roles that I mentioned. So they can recruit to pharmacies, paramedics, um, uh, physiotherapists, etc. And so they're bolstering, they sit around the primary care network, so you're creating smaller mini sort of primary care community provider models there. That's in its infancy, but will develop. And this is what I was saying, I think, as we work more as a place in those locality areas, and we may want to say, how do we connect in children's services? How do we connect in adult social care? How do, you know, how do we connect, connect in IAP services to those uh, sort of around those localities? I think that's the direction of travel and working together. The bit I'll just will say again, it, coming out of national policy, it seems like primary care networks are going to be those anchor agencies in the system and, and actually services will connect and work around those primary care networks. And I think that's what is it. So additional resources going in and I think that's identified nationally as a priority as well. Thank you. Just uh, on primary care, the Health and Wellbeing Board's next meeting on the 11th of November. Primary care is one of the agenda items, so if uh, anyone's free, uh, can always attend or watch it. Uh, oh, no, it's not recorded, is it? It's, uh, it's, a, it's a fully in-person meeting, uh, but we are talking about primary care then, because as you say, Linda, lots of people have got lots of uh, questions and thoughts about primary care, so we're going to pick it up at the Health and Wellbeing Board. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Kersley. Yeah, thanks. Um, so obviously you talked about um, the CCGs are going to become null and it's going to go into the, the um, ICS. Um, but you mentioned that there are like the, the individual areas are still going to have teams. So like for Doncaster, for example, um, how can we ensure that the ICS, that decisions that, that would affect Doncaster are made in conjunction with local people and communities that will be affected by it? Um, so we, we are actually, we, we, I think we just agreed what it is that we want Doncaster to do when I say that as a partnership. So we will be writing to our ICS colleagues and saying this is how we want Doncaster to work and this is what we want responsibility for and, 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 uh, and, this, and this is how we're going to do it to give you confidence because now uh, uh, what will happen is the ICS team will have the statutory responsibility and they'll want to know that whatever we're doing in place we're doing it properly on their behalf. So that's the first thing. So, but we've, we've set an ambition of, of what we want to do. Um, that, I think, will be through a committee arrangement. So you'll have your board at South Yorkshire level and there'll be a committee, and it could be a Doncaster ICB committee, and then we'll all sit around the table and make decisions on that. I think that needs to be open and transparent, and that'll be, that'll be a one 
thing that we would need to do. Um, we we um, we will again. We've just had this conversation with Damien, and we want to go away, and we want to talk about how we establish that and, and as a partnership, and and agree how that might run. Um, we do really great work at the moment with Healthwatch, for example, and uh, you know working with our public and our patients, etc. We have patient forums, so there's many many ways in which we do that. But I think fundamentally, um, the um, the, the way in which we make decisions collectively as Doncaster and on behalf of the ICS in future um, needs to be done in an open, transparent way and, and through public meetings, etc. would be my view. That's great, thank you. And uh, one of our last questions is uh, Lynn Derrick. Thank you. Thank you. I think some of the question has been answered along the line. Do we know how the financial allocation of funding for South Yorkshire ICS is going, is getting decided. And will you be using the each local CCG current methodology of funding allocations to guide how much Doncaster will get in the first couple of years? of where we are in the year and to create stability I would imagine there's probably the majority of what Doncaster receives this year unless it's agreed that we'll do things once across the system across South Yorkshire and we all agree to that but I would, I would expect it won't change much in the first year but it will quickly become an ICS allocation and not a Doncaster Rotherham Barnsley Sheffield allocation but we don't know how it will be allocated yet Thank you all for your time today. It's been fantastic and really answering these questions, especially uh, under the uncertainty that we have and that some things could change. Um, I'd just like to ask the panel uh, if there's any extra burning questions that they might have before we wrap up. Brilliant. Um, and um, I'd also like to ask the panel uh, for the recommendations. The panel is asked to consider this information provided by Doncaster NHS CCG and the Director of Public Health in the form of this presentation and that questions and answers. Um, do we feel like we have had enough information today to um, consider? Brilliant, fantastic. Um, if we ever, you know, we might need a couple of days to think over it and we can revisit our work plan if we feel like we need extra information later on. But I'm um, very happy with everything today. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for your time. Um, now we'll go on to item number seven, um, the update on the Doncaster Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, which is on pages 25 and 28 on the agenda. Um, and I think this is another presentation. Yeah. Thank you. So. Oh, okay, brilliant. Uh, thank you for waiting. Uh. So as um, John um, just gets uh, set up, I thought it was good to see these items together. So as we you know, just heard about the new system and the ICS, the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment is something that's going to be really important for, for us to be happy that it um, uh, contains the right sort of information for us, able to, for us to be able to influence the ICS and to hold the ICS to account. So um, when you were talking about the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment earlier, you might have been thinking, well, what does it look like? What is it? Well, uh, here's the answer. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so I'm not the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, but thanks for that introduction. So but what I can talk to you through is um, our plan for this year, what we've done so far. And, and as Rupert says, this is just a, this is a cog with kind of in the, in the machinery of, uh, of the reforms that, uh, that uh, Jackie has uh, set out. So there's two things I want to go through. I'll go through the, the plan and the policy that we've got. And I also want to um, do a quick demo as well of what we've recently built in terms of some, uh, some web tools that uh, we can show. And then I'm really happy to take any, any questions as we go forward. 
Okay, so I've taken this quote. It's actually quite an old one. Uh, it's from the Department of Health in 2011, but it's still really relevant. Uh, this is from some of the um, original sort of guidance around what a, a JSNA is, because it, it, in, in many ways it does what it says on the tin. It's a, it's a joint, uh, so across the partnership, across um, uh, across the different Doncaster organisations, it's strategic. So we, we we take a kind of population view of uh, particular topics, and we look at the, the needs of the population. So it kind of does what it says on the tin. But this, what it's here for is a decision-making tool. So we look at our population needs, and we publish them in some way, and then they are used by um, official bodies, uh, such as this, the uh, Health and Wellbeing Board, or, or, or more informal groups, to understand the needs of the population and for that to inform decision-making and planning. And that's, that's been around for some time. Um, so, and that's evolved. Uh, different, different places have different ways of approaching this, and what I want to do now is talk about the way in which Doncaster wants to do it currently, uh, and, uh, and, and what our plans for the future are. So there's three, three blocks uh, of things I want to talk about. So one is the policy that we've recently agreed that the Health and Wellbeing Board uh, discussed uh, this summer. Then there's two things I want to demonstrate in terms of things we've actually developed just in the last couple of months. And then the, next, the last one is just what our, our forward plan looks like. Um, often when I'm, I, can, I can come to meetings like this, you, you often want to present a kind of final finished product, but actually what I want to do now is just show what's happening at the moment, where we're in kind of a few months into a plan, some stuff that we've done in the meantime and, uh, and where we've got to. So hopefully that will, uh, no, nothing I show today is, is, is ever really set in stone, it's just where we're up to on a plan. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's, all, it's, all, uh, it's all kind of up for grabs. So where we got to uh, is that, that that guidance was set out uh, well, a decade ago really uh, in terms of what um, uh, what a, a joint strategic needs assessment should be for a place and there have been over the years many different ways that we've done this in uh, in um, in the borough a few years ago we agreed a new policy which was around how we'd want to kind of more proactively publish some of the information that we have and, and how we'd want to, rather than producing this great big document that we call the Doncaster JSNA each year or so, which is often you know, several hundred pages long and goes into lots of technical detail, all of which is kind of correct and useful, potentially doesn't quite hit the mark in terms of accessibility or uh, making sure it's bang up to date or, or making sure that people actually look at it and use it and, and know where to find information. So 2018, we, the Health and Wellbeing Board um, agreed a new policy that we'd want to refresh to um, uh, make it more accessible uh, and to focus into individual areas so we could do investigations into particular topics at any given time and do them in it doing do them in whatever order meets local priorities so not say not doing uh, trying to eat, do the whole thing at once obviously quite a lot's happened in the world since uh, late 2018 uh, in the world of health and care um, so uh, it made sense in 2021 to just refresh that policy in context of happened uh, in terms of uh, the health of the population and the, uh, the world uh, but also what we've learned through that process we've learned a lot uh, locally nationally uh, globally around how we understand the health needs of populations and how that uh, and how wider determinants uh, affect them so I've got a couple of uh, so four what things and two how things so the four what's uh, one is we will look at population level outcomes. So we will look at a range of measures that we can uh, establish and measure the, the, the health or the well-being needs of a population. So we've got about 44 things that over the years uh, we have established as a, what we call an outcomes framework. So it looks at um, across a life course, so from uh, a bit of a cliche, but kind of for cradle to grave, all the things that could happen to you across a life. And we've demonstrated about 44 measures that we can demonstrate, which, are, which will give you a broad enough take of uh, the health and well-being of a population. Um, the second one is, uh, it's a bit of a management cliche this one, so sorry, it's a deep dives, but basically investigations into particular topics. So rather than, as I say, trying to do everything at once um, or, um, or trying to just, just look at a very high level, if there's particular things that um, uh, the Health and Wellbeing Board or a group such as this or uh, individual service areas want to have an investigation into, we can, uh, we can go deep into a topic. A third one, and this has come up a, a lot this morning already, is around localities. So how can we take, uh, it's not just a population level, uh, but take a geographical approach to understanding particular population health needs, because it's not just about the borough as a whole. Uh, you will know as, as ward councillors the, the, uh, the diversity we've got across the place. Uh, so how can we, um, first of all, understand the diversity of that? 
also respond to it. So we will have different um, organisations, different setups, different services that exist in different places. So how can we manage them um, effectively? And the fourth one, which I really wanted to focus on this year, because uh, the pandemic's really helped um, focus minds on this, is I've called it operations, but it's a bit of a catch-all term, really, in terms of rather than purely looking very strategically at a population level to understand the health needs, how can we take um, what I would call a sort of population health lens, so it's a bit of a public health term, but how can we look at the population, take a population angle to operational service challenges? So... Um, if we were looking at, for example, waiting lists for a particular service, rather than just counting the numbers of people in it, actually, can we take a population view of it? So, um, looking at the demographics, the, uh, the protected characteristics, wh understanding where those people live, uh, understanding what might um, the, their situations in terms of employment, housing, um, uh, family situations, things like that. So. So how, how can we manage the operations of services by taking a population health lens? So those are the four um, what things. And the two how things, um, one is about we produce some summaries and some statements. So again, it's not what I really want to focus on accessibility. So rather than having these great big reports that um, appreciate not everyone will find particularly useful, um, produce short and pithy summaries and statements that we can publish really proactively and push out in, in a useful way. Uh, and then link to this. Um, really proactive publication. So we're going to really focus on some web uh, tools over the next few months to get these out so they're not necessarily tucked into kind of committee reports or when people saved on people's uh, desktops or in people's inboxes. So really pushing these things out. Linked into that is we want to have an amnesty, as we're going to call it, for existing information. So the last thing I want to do is just um, recreate the wheel in my own team. So have, there is tons of information out there across, uh, not the council, but also our partnership uh, across partners where we know we are either talking to people and engaging with them or analysing information about um, the services that people have or understanding the population uh, that, uh, that they're serving. Uh, and we want to catch as many of these as possible and proactively push them out, so long as they're obviously suitable for the public domain. Um, uh, and that collectively, all those six things will be our JSNA. So rather than this being this big document we publish each year, that, that collection of stuff that I've got uh, outlined on the screen will be the thing that we, uh, we call the Doncaster JSNA. Okay, so uh, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I'll keep going. Um, so we are going to use the Team Doncaster website. It makes sense in terms of the way we set up ourselves as a partnership to host um, our new... Um, repository. So we're, we're starting um, and we're going to start with a few things. One is around the outcomes framework that I mentioned and another one around our um, demographics and localities and communities information that we have. So I, I won't be through the slide. It'll make more sense when I just, if I just show you, to be honest. So if I just turn this on and go to here. So uh, we use a technical tool called Power BI, but I won't, I won't go into the technical bit because this is not what this is about. Um, and I wanted to show you, this is what, at some point, we will be, we'll get onto our website uh, and hopefully we'll get that in the next few weeks. We're just finishing off some of the developments. As I said, we'd, I wanted to show you this as a kind of work in progress. So previously, you may have seen and you will get some of these almost kind of performance scorecards, looks like this, which come through um, things like health and wellbeing board papers. So we've still got that and this is our part of our outcomes framework. And you can see that there's a whole range of measures um, um, relating to a, a range of different health and well-being uh, issues, and we can we can measure them. What we do want to do, though, is make them far more um, accessible uh, and useful to people. Uh, and this is something that will be in the public domain. So rather than publishing um, uh, just reams of stats, I want to make these in a, in, a, in a useful format to people. So we're going through the process now of publishing these kind of infographics and dashboards that hopefully will be accessible and useful to people uh, as well yourselves, uh, but also members of the public in terms of how we, uh, uh, how we report this. So I can give you a bit of a live demo. Um, so if I start with, um, I'll do this one of childhood obesity. So I'll show you how we built this so you can see how we want to stack up some of the data and some of the information. Um, so if I, uh, you can see uh, the childhood obesity statistics for, um, uh, for five-year-olds, part of the child measurement program. We've built it so you can also go right into the data for people who particularly want to see the trends over time. You can see how uh, Doncaster, uh, which is the purple line, relates to the, uh, the regional average. So you can see that our trend is broadly in line with what's happening regionally, but we are 
kind of outliers in terms of the, uh, the national picture. So um, this is not an uncommon picture, uh, to be honest. Uh, and for those who really want to, uh, uh, people like uh, me and my teams, uh, go into the real detail, we, we've made sure that all the kind of original source information is available there too. So the Public Health England fingertips tool uh, is available there. So hopefully you can see the throughput of, rather than just producing some um, potentially quite dry um, uh, data packs, we want to start producing these more kind of infographic-led things where actually people can, those who do want to have a look at the detail, uh, can. So this is our outcomes framework. There's the measures that all talks in there, and we've now updated this in line with uh, the kind of latest published information. So that's that one. Uh, there's also this one, which we will also get... Um, ready soon. So this is our Doncaster demographics. Wait for the Wi-Fi to kick in. Okay, there we go. Um, so these are our, uh, this is the latest Office for National Statistics data on the population of Doncaster. Our age bands are, um, uh, and uh, you can see that there. Uh, we've also got the populations by each ward, and there's also what we have, our 88 community areas. So if I just picked one, it'll also tell you the breakdown of those individual areas. This, I mean, from my own team's perspective, this is sorts of information we get asked a lot, and I know from a, a, a ward member's perspective, you would also might want to have a look at your own ward's information too, so we, we want to make sure that, again, this is proactively published. Uh, we've also got information here on uh, tidbits like our ageing population, so I always think this is a fantastic uh, um, uh, statistic around about 2025. For the first time in history, our um, our, over, uh, our aging population to the over 65s will be old, more than the uh, the under 18. So that is a that is a demographic shift that has never happened before. So I mean, nothing will happen on the first of uh, the first of January 2025. But in terms of our population needs, I think that's just a fantastic statistic. Um, we also want to proactively publish information on our economy. So, I mean, that's a really important thing at all times, but I mean, today in particular, uh, the furlough scheme ends. So that will have um, um, a big impact on all these people uh, that are currently fur furloughed. It's about 5,700 people in Doncaster uh, on the furlough scheme at the moment. Um, we we'll also want to release information uh, available on our uh, unemployment, so you can see some of the uh, unemployment rates across the borough, including some of our uh, unemployment hotspots. Um, so all this information has really existed before, and all of this is new, but the focus I want to push out is we haven't really pulled it together collectively before. Um, it's often tucked into very obscure government portals and government websites, and we want to make sure that that is in the public domain. We also want to uh, focus on um, uh, well-being. So here's, our, uh, here's the indices and all of deprivation. We have also can release information on fuel poverty, um, household overcrowding, et cetera, et cetera. And hopefully you get the sense now of what we want to achieve. And also hopefully you get the sense that this is the start, not the end. So there's a whole load more things that we can continue to, uh, to add into here. So that's, that's just a bit of a demo that hopefully gives you a bit of a flavor of what we want to do differently this, uh, this time around rather than um, kind of just producing uh, the traditional reports. If I just dive back in. So, tons of information in there, even at the, the start, but just to give you a, a, a few insights, I guess what you'd call them, in terms of what this, what this means uh, at this point. So we know that um, we have um, some interesting migration patterns in Doncaster. So uh, people tend to, uh, there's quite a lot of outward migration when people reach uh, adulthood. So we can see the dip in the Doncaster demographics at that kind of 15 to 19 and 20 to 24 year old band. People often leave, people go to university or, or move to another place. People also come back. So there's a lot, there's a spike in our demographics at around 25. I've also talked about the population increases. I won't talk that again. Um, our economy, really important in terms of health and well-being, but also important in, in its own right. Um, we've had some of the lowest, interestingly, furlough rates in the country, but we've also had some of the highest um, um, unemployment uh, rates on universal credit. So uh, either way, we have some uh, significant economic challenges, and we also know that young people have been hardest hit uh, with the... Uh, um, uh, with those economic challenges. It's 44 outcomes on that outcomes framework. I'm obviously not going to go through them all. Um, but again, this isn't news, but we do know that there are challenges within our, um, um, within our population. So 
sadly, there are more where we do worse in the national average than, the we, than we do better. There are some where we are, there are many where we're improving, but there is still a, a, an inequalities gap between us and the national average where we, um, we're seeking to improve it. So in the very short term, so what, what, what's in, on my plan at the moment, um, we just need to, we want to finish some of the stuff off. And I say this is, um, this is at the beginning at the end. So I want to get these web tools that I uh, demoed um, out into the public domain. So we're going to just finish off some of those uh, last loose ends and get them uh, published for you and for others. Yes. We want to tighten up some of the timeliness of that data. We rely quite often on some official published stats, um, but we know that we've got some local statistics available through, uh, th through the council and its partners, so we can add in some local nuance. Um, and then as um, kind of linked to everything we've, we've talked about this morning, how, how do we make sure that we link this as much as possible into the, the kind of the policy uh, world too? So it's not just a... Um, a set of information. It's actually a set of information and a series of plans in terms of what we are, what we're doing about some of these challenges. So that's that's just the very short term. That that ties into the long term. So I've touched on the um, the the policy uh, links. So everything that uh, Jackie outlined in terms of where the JSNA and other strategic um, documents such as this will fit into a policy making cycle. So it demonstrates. This is the Doncaster population. These are the needs. These are the challenges that we have, and that's part of the, the Doncaster story and the Doncaster offer. Uh, we also want to um, add to that outcomes framework those 44 act, um, uh, indicators we're looking at to look at more wider determinants uh, information. Um, so adding in more things around um, uh, housing and the economy and the employment and uh, air quality and the, the kind of the list goes on. Um, we will also want to get this amnesty up and running. So, uh, over the next, once we've got some of the techie web stuff out of the way, we will uh, we'll set up our sort of amnesty project, and we want to kind of do the rounds really across the council and its partners to uh, to get up and running. Interestingly, uh, we also get the census information. So, we've had the 2021 census likely in sort of spring 22. We will actually start to get that information back from. Office of National Statistics. So, we'll, then then we'll get a huge range of updated information on our. Uh, population and then the last one which is it's kind of no mean feat really is really around what I think the work plan should be focused on um, for the next few months um, it's, it's not unsurprising but it, it ties back into the operation strand of the, the, the four uh, that I identified before so as much as possible I think we should be pointing the kind of analytical lens over the, the kind of the winter challenges that we're definitely going to face it's not going to be a uh, certainly not going to be an easy time and that I don't, you only have to open the newspaper to kind of see that challenge at a national level or a, or a local level so my uh, our suggestion and what the kind of health and wellbeing board has been considering as well as the kind of planning cycle in, in the council is how much can we take a population level approach as much as possible to the challenges that we see through operational um, operational services and the pressures that we know we've got so whether that's waiting lists kind of the latent demand of people um, coming into uh, uh, the health or care system after not being seen for a while uh, or if it's around covid itself as a disease and, and the kind of epidemiology and surveillance that we've set up so that would be my uh, suggestion for the, the the more pressing bit of the of, of the plan and then there was there's a whole range obviously of other health and well-being topics that we can look at over the coming uh, over the coming months so that's it in terms of my presentation. I appreciate I've covered a lot, both in terms of just the background, the, the actual technical bit of it, and what we want to uh, focus on uh, coming forward. And I appreciate uh, your uh, your thoughts uh, and feedback. Also, I, I hope you appreciate this. I'm genuinely coming here as a kind of working uh, where we're up to, rather than this, this is the final thing we finish, because it's useful to get information as we go along. So I'm um, really happy to take any uh, questions, comments, or feedback. I just turn this on to there you go thanks so much Dan that was fantastic and um, it's been it's great to see a working uh, you know a working prototype or um, and see how the process has gone through um, I'm just going to kick off uh, with the questions um, in terms uh, it's stated that Doncaster should utilize an asset based approach for the uh, JSNA, uh, which provides a new way of challenging health inequalities. And then obviously you've kind of got um, the stuff about uh, the winter pressures uh, come in. Obviously, 
asset base is, tends to be quite positive, uh, but also things to make assets, there's all stuff like loneliness that's quite difficult to capture. I just wonder if you could expand on how you might um, be able to balance that kind of uh, asset versus more negative and, and difficult to measure um, stuff. No, it's, it's, a re it's a really good question. It's, it's, it's a tough one to grapple with. The problem with this, the way in which a JSNA is framed is it, it, it tends to look at need, and need is often framed as a, as a, not to be too dismissive, but as a kind of bad thing. So you often end up measuring things that are wrong, and that's, uh, so you measure how many people have ended up in this service or in this situation, or you measure poor air quality or poor housing, that sort of thing. So, and that's fine. You, you've got, we, we have to understand what's happening, and it, it, we, we need to understand those challenges, but we also need to understand the things that will give us leverage to make those things better, and that's where we need to look at needs. So um, I guess there's three sorts of assets you probably consider. So there's the, the hard assets, physical assets, the buildings, uh, but there's also in terms of um, um, uh, sort of wider determinants of the infrastructure, so housing, uh, transport, uh, and pub, um, public transport, uh, education infrastructure, things like that. So there's we want to make sure that we've captured that in some way. So that's the hard assets, but that's probably the, the simplest one. There's the service assets as well. So what services exist in in individual places? And that kind of goes to, to the localities bit that I mentioned at the beginning. So um, what services do we have, either a universal offer or in, in individual places that could help make a difference to some of those um, challenges or needs that we've identified? And then there's the bit that's the hardest to measure, but that's probably the most important one, is the sort of soft assets or the community assets. So that might be around community groups, uh, but actually it might be around more, much softer ones around kind of thoughts and feelings and aspirations or kind of culture and leisure that exist in individual places. It's, you can't, can't really count that stuff, and I wouldn't pretend to even uh, do that. But you can capture it. You can capture voice. You can capture um, experience. You can capture... Um, um, kind of the emotional side. So I wouldn't suggest we try and measure things which are kind of soft assets, but I do suggest that we, as much as possible, take that qualitative lens on some things at, at times. So um, that it, the, the, the stories of people, their experience of services or their experience of you know, life and, and life situations is just as important to understand needs and assets, I think, rather than um, the, the, the hard measuring stuff that we would definitely, definitely do. So hopefully that captures that, uh, that question for you. Rupert. Yeah, just to add to that, so I completely agree with John that localities element is really important and people will know about the, um, some of the appreciative inquiry that's been going on across the, the borough and seeing how the locality plans deliver, uh, develop is going to be a part of that. The other thing that we could uh, think about is how we frame some of those outcomes. So we, also, we often talk about uh, the number of people who smoke uh, and actually it's much more positive to talk about the number of people that don't smoke. Uh, some of that is just a, um, a way that the data is captured and presented nationally. So if we were to talk about numbers that don't smoke, people would say, well, why are you doing that? Because everyone else talks about it in different ways and it's more difficult to compare. But I think how we frame some of that information is going to be important. And uh, I think that's why John's right in also saying this is a process. So this is a some of this is about pulling stuff together but then we want to think about how we frame it in a much more positive uh, way and it's um, and that's because it ha actually has an impact on people so if people think that most people in the borough don't smoke they may be less likely to to smoke whereas if, if, if people think that uh, a lot of people do smoke they think it's much more socially acceptable Fantastic, I quite like that uh, reverse psychology and uh, being able to uh, rethink how we how language is important in this. Um, Councillor Knowles, uh, you have got a great uh, follow-up question here. In terms of engagement, how are you going to capture the voice of local people to truly reflect what is happening in communities? Thanks. No, that's a that's a really good question and such and such a fundamental one. I think there's there's two ways of doing this. Um, so one is actually acknowledging that we already do a lot, uh, and so as a, as part of that sort of amnesty or building of a repository, what we actually re 
primarily the task needs to be to capture what we've already captured. And, and, and I think it was you yourself who uh, mentioned this morning around the, uh, the youth ambassadors and the Make Your Mark survey. So that's, that's a fantastic example. Uh, and I think we're re I would say we're really good at um, doing engagement work in specific specific topics or specific areas what we probably need to work at is how we share that knowledge across for other for other teams and other partners so um, um, we've got a whole range of um, surveys of engagement that um, you, so the make your mark report or the um, I forget its official name but the, the well-being survey that goes out to all uh, all pupils in all, in all schools there's all sorts of information there and we should be making sure that it's not just used in a sort of schools environment or a youth engagement environment that we you know we proactively uh, publish them. Similarly, um, on adult social care, for example, we have a, a range of different surveys that go out to um, care users, to carers, uh, uh, and um, different providers. And we're really good at using those in the services and how we manage services. What we probably need to think about is how we share that knowledge and share that learning to other other bits of the system. So, um, so that's the first bit. So, how do we capture what we already have? And we don't want to just keep asking the same questions over and over again. Uh, and then the second bit is actually how we manage additional engagement. So I'm not, uh, I'm not suggesting that this can purely be done by capturing what we already have. Uh, we set up a, um, a brand, I guess, about in about 2018 that we've established locally for the way in which we can do some consultation, which is called Doncaster Talks. And we've arranged a, there's been a, a range of different surveys and engagement, which um, under that banner, some of which have been small. Sort of pulse surveys, so we will set up a, a, a survey that goes out, and um, we may get a few hundred um, respondents, and that gives us a, a short, kind of sharp um, response. We've done some that have been really big, and I've had literally thousands of responses. So a significant percentage of the borough will respond. Um, so one was around the borough strategy, and one was uh, I know there was um, at the beginning of COVID, we did a Doncaster talks on um, family experience and uh, schools, and again, these had thousands of responses. So continuing to use that Doncaster Talks brand and the, and the sort of range of research techniques that exist um, under that, I think will be really helpful. So if you wanna do little pulse surveys, that's, that's fantastic. Or if you wanna do the big uh, kind of whole shebang, that's also a, a good opportunity. And the third one goes back to that, um, I say it was a bit of a cliche, but that deep dives approach. So if they want to do something really deep or really involved on a particular topic, so um, uh, youth unemployment, for example, and how that affects um, people we can um, we can commission and deliver specific bits of work whether that's in-house in the council we can uh, we have teams who can do this or we want to work with academics or um, or work with community organizations uh, or work with staff who work in those areas so um, I guess so three things so one we acknowledge what we already do and make sure that we publish and, and, and share that the second one use the tools we've already got so the Doncaster Talks sort of toolkit um, and the third one is when, if and when we want to do new and additional things, we can uh, we can set them up. We've got we have officers who can do that, or, or we can you know, commission particular bits of work. And we should be working with staff and community groups who work with those individuals to make that relevant. Um, hopefully, that uh, that captures that for you. I mean, the other thing just to say about that is, of course, decision makers will still have a responsibility to make sure that the voice of people affected by their decisions are heard so as well as the joint strategic needs assessment being one mechanism to capture it when people start taking decisions so whether it's health and wellbeing board cabinet there's still a requirement to make sure that there is um, engagement and the voice is, is heard so it's not just the only mechanism thank you so much for that uh, Linda Curran, um, would you like to ask your question? Thank you. Is there a timeline, um, like a pipeline of work packages within this um, program? Uh, yes, yes, there is. Uh, so first of all, I think this is ongoing. This won't finish. Um, so there will always be more. There's always more stuff that we can find out, uh, which is uh, exciting bit of my job, um, and frustrating bit as well because you never, you never actually feel like you're finished. Uh, but very practically, uh, so the sort of website resources that I've talked about, I'm hoping to get that in a matter of days or weeks. It's just got a few uh, loose ends to tie up. Then we want to focus on the um, sort of repository and the. 
uh, that sort of amnesty. So that'll be a project that's sort of from now till about Christmas, roughly. Uh, but importantly, th that sort of priority that I discussed, which was around um, how can we focus a population approach and an inequalities approach to winter challenges, sort of sets its own parameters, really, in terms of the sort of starting now through to uh, to, to spring. We, we are already very much uh, in the in the folds of winter planning and um, can thinking about what the pressures that we may face. That, I think, gives us more than enough work uh, to be focused on um, between now and, uh, and next spring and summer, um, and by which time I'm sure there will be more pressures and, and complications across the system, which will, again, give us plenty more work to uh, chip away at. So, um, yeah, so a few practical things, but also the, the joy of this is it's never quite finished. So. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Pursley. Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, that that looks really great, by the way. The you know the website and stuff. I think uh, the last eighteen months has given us all a new appreciation for graphs and uh, someone that likes that sort of thing. Anyway, that's great. Um, it's really in depth. With that in mind, this might be a little bit of a silly question now, considering how in depth it is. But um, what do you think will be the the sort of the main challenges of developing the JSNA um, as time goes on? Uh, it's not a silly question at all. Um, so it's, it's probably some practical stuff. So. Um, from, from a sort of management side, there's this kind of analytical capacity when uh, my team and the teams that I work with across the CCG and the Trust, we're, we're not twiddling our thumbs at the moment. There's quite a lot of, uh, it's, it's quite a lot of work to do in terms of, I mean, you, you joke, but I mean, the COVID and, and its pressures creates quite a lot of time in terms of working out what's going on, plus the pressures that we see from a sort of service management point of view, whether it's social care um, or um, economic development, there's just quite a lot on. So analytical capacity, it will always be, uh, always be a tough one, but that, um, it's kind of why I want to say that we should be focusing on the here and now and the, the present issues that we're facing. So we're not doing something over here and this is the thing we're going to call the JSNA and here's the, the real world problems that we're dealing with. Actually, that, um, they should be one and the same. So I, I, I hope that's the a way of, of mitigating that problem. Uh, and then the other one is um, a more, slightly more conceptual one, which is kind of the... We, we, this is still fundamentally an analytical piece of work. Uh, it's a, uh, the JSNA has that sort of background. And the challenge we'll always have is the ability to see the wood for the trees and be, you know, across however many things you want to look at, and measure or engage on, uh, the ability to find a narrative around what does this mean and, and then what should we do about it? Um, because it's, you can have the, if I had a magic wand and had the best needs assessment tomorrow, we still have the challenges about what do we do with this information and how do we make sure that we can um, set up a plan, resource the plan and deliver it given all the, uh, the constraints and, and changes that we have. So. Yeah, three things. One is just um, our, the pressures that we have. Uh, the second one around the sort of st conceptual uh, model of how do we how do we build this and make sure that we have a narrative of what's happening in the community. And then the third one is making sure that we actually use it in a way that we can build plans on. That's great. Thank you. Usually, the uh, biggest challenge with uh, those needs assessments is the sort of face validity of it. So. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, when you see the information, does it actually ring true to what your experience is? And particularly, I think what will the challenge is with the pandemic. So you'll have seen that the Office for National Statistics has just started to publish data, which has come out through the pandemic. So showing life expectancies started to fall. And as John mentioned, some of the, a lot of the data is national data, which is often 12 or 18 months behind. And I think that's the, that's a big risk if the um, JSNA doesn't paint a picture that resonates with local people, decision makers. People might just put it to one side and go, well, it's, it's in interesting, but it's wrong. So I'm not going to use it. I'm going to use other things to, to help me decide, which is why trying to work out where we've got more up to date local data is really important to, to get in. Thank you so much. Um, that's actually a, a quite a good uh, a good question um, in that what part will the ICS play with the JSNA and vice versa, especially considering if we use it, that's when the data could be two years out of date and we need a, you know, a clinical response. I'll start with this one, but uh, I think Rupert might uh, jump in as well. So. I, th I think what came out of the discussion this morning was the importance of knowing the place, um, whether that's on you know official statistics or actually the voice of people, uh, experiences of services, um, or our you know collective 
uh, sets of plans that we have. What came out time and time again in, in the discussion this morning, and I, and I wouldn't claim to be an expert on ICS arrangements, was how do we ensure that we've got collectively a, a, a strong story about the borough, whether that's on the stats or that's the, the experience of people or the communities or understanding of the communities they live in. Um, so we don't see that this is just this one amorphous blob that is the borough called Doncaster, and that's just a you know a chunk of, of South Yorkshire. That I think that, that would miss the point, and I'm, I'm sure you I'm sure you understand that. So. Yeah, it, it, without sounding too cliched, it's about how can we tell the story of what's happening, uh, and we have we got a narrative around uh, uh, the experience of, of, of people. But I'm sure Rupert will understand a bit more from a sort of actual technical governance side. Yeah, I mean, I think the um, I think the structure of the assessments almost as important as the detail in terms of influence in the ICS. So, in particular, the way that John described sort of starting well and then there's living well and ageing well. So going back to the question we had earlier about, well, how will we make sure that children aren't forgotten? Well, the fact that our JSNA has got a big section on starting well 0 to 19 shows that it's important. We'll be asking the ICS about how they uh, respond to that. And then you know, linked to that is the way that um, John's also got information in there about um, what might happen in the future in terms of ageing. So it's not just about, don't think just about now, think about the future and also some of those wider determinants, which again legitimises health partners investing in fuel poverty and housing and other things that traditionally they've, they've not. And then this, the final thing to say is remember that the JSNA is then used by us to develop our health and wellbeing strategy. So it's part of that, seeing the wood for the trees will be up to us. And actually, almost we get two bites at the cherry. So if there's something in the JSNA that says, you know, uh, I don't know, care for people with dementia, it, it, you know, could be better. Uh, we also then, if we reflect that in our strategy, we might also be saying these are our plans for dementia and this is what, what, what we want the ICS to do. And I think that's where we'll have the biggest influence is where there's something in the JSNA that we've then prioritised in our strategy. I think it will be difficult for the ICS to say we don't want to, you know, we don't think that's important. Brilliant, thank you for that. Um, that leads really quite nice uh, into uh, Councillor Bluff's question. What role can scrutiny play in this and can we have an update in the future? I'll, I'll answer the second bit first. Yes, that's, that's the easy question. <laughs> um, so I guess the, the point of a JSNA is to be joint and strategic. So it is always going to be an overarching uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, it, there's the technical bit that it's part of the, the work plan for the health and well-being board, so you can consider that how that feeds into that, that kind of governance piece. But I guess there's probably a softer bit around scrutiny around what does this, what have you, what have you learned from the, these findings, and what what have we seen about the population or the voices of of people in different places, and what have we learned about the diversity of um, different parts of the borough, and how has that fed into decision making, and what has that meant for the scrutiny work plan, but also the, just the, the general plans that you see uh, and the kind of service performance so yeah so there's a technical bit around it, it's sort of legally part of the health and well-being board infrastructure and that's how it sits so if, if you have a relationship with that with that group you can you can you can sort of see those findings and, and that. but actually I think probably the more in, I want to say more interesting uh, the more uh, uh, fundamental bit is um, yeah what have you learned from it what kind of tidbits of information have you seen what um, uh, stats or figures of kind of uh, you've uh, raised your eyebrows and thought about how has that fed into a planning cycle of of different um, um, uh, reports that you come across or, uh, or as Rupert says kind of feeds into for strategies so it's kind of the hard and the soft bit I think and yes you can have an update I, I mean I sort of completely agree there's something about the overall sort of structure and how it, it feed in but then the element that looked at deep dives, so thinking about the work plan for scrutiny, some of the elements we go, you know, we know they're on the work plan and we go and ask, you know, John and the team to, you know, prepare some information on that. Um, and there may be a better way of thinking about how we commission those deep dives or how you commission them, how you get involved, sort of setting them out as well as just receiving them once they're they're done 
but I, I think there's you know quite good space to have a conversation about well what do we need um, going forward on this so it should be more than just receiving reports you should have a role in terms of shaping some of the elements that we uh, uh, look at that's brilliant thank you so much um, does any anybody else in the panel have any questions that they'd like to ask? Brilliant. Uh, John, thank you so much, and Rupert, for all your time today, and Caroline. Um, it, we've not had much to say, but <laughs> thank you for being here. Thank you. I, do, I was going to say just about the JSNA, actually. What I find really exciting being quite new to Doncaster, although it's nearly a year, but it feels new because I've only been in the building five times. So. Um, it's very odd, but I'm quite excited about the JSNA in this approach. This is not what all councils have coming from other places. And I think for me, what's really exciting is it, that high level info gives us all opportunities to do what, what Rupert was talking about in terms of those key lines of inquiry and actually looking at what are the areas that seem a bit off and don't feel right and actually give us all an opportunity to take a bit of a deep dive into that and inform future direction of travel. So, yeah, but thank you. Thank you. Um, the recommendations on this is the Help and Adult Social Care Overview and Scrutiny Panel are asked to note the findings of the GSJSNA to date and to note the forward plan. Are we happy with that? Fantastic. And uh, the next thing is looking at our um, revisiting the overview and scrutiny work plan um, and the council's forward plan of key decisions. Um, I perhaps uh, that sounds brilliant <laughs> okay I'm just going to bring to your attention about the next meeting that's taking place in November so um, firstly there'll be an update on winter planning which we have received before as a panel and I'll make sure the previous minutes are circulated to you so you can have a look at what happened last year also um, the update from Doncaster and Bassett Law Teaching Hospitals. Uh, we will have the um, the, the Chief Ex Officer, um, Executive Richard Parker, coming from there, so he'll be here to give you an update and answer questions. Uh, it might be that you want to focus on certain areas, which is what we have done in the past. And again, I can uh, forward you those minutes. So that's key, what's happening at the next meeting. Um, from today, there'll be we might want to bring updates back on the ICS and JSNA. They don't have to be at a formal meeting. We can do them outside the meeting or in a briefing now, etc. But you can decide later on. And from the forward plan, looking at there, there's nothing key that you might want to consider at, at present going forward. Uh, but we can keep an eye on that. Um, and we can hold discussions in, outside the meeting. Okay. That's fantastic. Thank you, Caroline, for that update. And thank you to everybody that uh, spoke today and for all the panel for your fantastic uh, questions and engagement. Uh, really appreciate all your time today. And uh, that's the uh, meeting over. Thank you so much. <laughs>